Um, I'm Carol Smith and I work for Combat Stress. Uh, it is in UK the Veterans Mental Health Charity for, um, and I've been there for about 12 months now. So I'm not an expert, but I am learning and learning very quickly. I am a veteran, which you will have seen hopefully from um, your programs. Uh, and so I do have some experience uh, and understanding of what the veterans who come to us for help and support have been through. Let me just talk to you first of all, and I think Carl this morning was quite clear. Um, you know, the UK has probably the widest cover in terms of the veteran community. We only expect an individual to have served for one day uh, and then we treat them as a veteran. Uh, charities all have different approaches to that uh, and within their own particular articles they can define who they want to treat. At Combat Stress we're exactly the same uh, as MOD is and it's one day. So that means that anybody who has really been anywhere near the military will, can come to us uh, with their mental health problems. So accessing mental health care. The reality of life is that for most servicemen, the services that they receive when they are uh, actually uh, serving are very good. Um, but many in terms of the mental health situation don't want to declare that they've got a problem. For a whole variety of different reasons, not least of which is the stigma and the concern that the individual has about the impact that that will have on their own careers. And that means that they don't necessarily say that they need help. There's also a sort of, um, and I'm, I will use this in a, in, a, in a specific term, but there is this macho sense of we can get on with this, we can cope with this, we can do this, we can do anything. So we, don't, we haven't got a mental health problem. And a lot of people that I've talked to will actually say to me, oh, I didn't realize I had a mental health problem till some time later. And that is the reality for this group of people in a lot of respects, is they don't recognize what they're going through at the time they're going through it. So we quite often see this delayed onset of PTSD, and it is common amongst British veterans. And I'll show you something later on which shows the length of time it takes for individuals to actually declare that they have got a problem. And in some instances, that, that time can go up to 15 years after they've left the military not after they've actually experienced some traumatic event, but 15 years after they've left the military itself. So we've done, there's a lot of research gone on into mental health in the UK. Um, this has been updated more recently. I don't have the more updated figures, but what it does show is in reality, PTSD is not that much more prevalent amongst the community and military community than it is within the civilian community. But there is a difference. And it's a very, very clear difference that I've seen is how complicated that PTSD is for the military community. Because they put off coming and saying anything about it and wanting any treatment for it, when they do come forward, what you find is that it's quite complicated. There's a number of instances that may have created that problem Whereas in the civilian community, it is not quite so complicated. Now that's, that's being a little bit sort of um, selective. Uh, and certainly the research at the moment is starting to look at that and the needs of this veteran community in particular and trying to identify those differences. But certainly the people that we see have a much more complicated background to why they've come forward with these mental health problems. And that delayed end onset is, is, uh, is so common amongst the veteran community and is something that we see almost every day. But let's be clear, and I think we all need to be very, very clear about this, PTSD is not the only mental health problem. And it is only a small, albeit significant, group of people that have PTSD. And if that's one thing that I would say in terms of the communication, it's about being very clear about that so that you don't end up saying that every veteran is going to be under a banner of being mad, bad and sad because that does that community a disservice. And the majority of people can cope with transition and do cope with what they've faced in, in whilst they've served. But in essence, 
well, there is still a group that do need to be looked after and do need specific help and support. In effect, common mental health problems are double the rate compared to civilian working population. So in, in essence, it's not about that PTSD space. It's about that anxiety space. It's about depression. Those are the things, the common things that, that we all face at some stage. And the reality of life is lots of people face those sorts of things and lots of people don't need any treatment for them. Military personnel, in effect, face that more frequently. Um, and again, I think we heard from Carl this morning quite interestingly about the alcohol and substance misuse. Um, it is actually starting to go on a downward trend. Certainly the alcohol misuse is starting to go on a downward trend. But it has to be said that in overall terms, in UK, this is a big issue. And it has been a big issue for some time, but it's now being presented as something that needs to, to be addressed. And as a consequence, there are the, the military itself is starting to look at how it puts uh, policies in place that start to deal with this. And, and in effect, all of those charities that are out there that are looking after individuals who are, are um, facing difficulties are having to do the same thing and having to think about how do we help people overcome that substance misuse in the first instance before we can help them more formally with the mental health issues that they face. And it's quite interesting that it, then in essence, you know, it, it is in often, it's the youngsters, it is the younger generation that face these issues more so than it is the, the older generation. Suicide is another thing that you know, we all pay particular attention to. I want to be absolutely certain that we're doing what we need to do to address the issues around suicide. But we do know that, that the reality of life is it, it's very similar to civilian rates. There are some differences, and again, it's the youngsters, it's those who are under 24 who have left the service often earlier than they'd anticipated and may well have pre-existing issues before they join the military who then find difficulty in the early stages of their transition out of service life. So suicide is something we all have to pay attention to, but we need to be, again, clear about how it sits in the overall, uh, for, the, for the whole population, not just that within the military. So what happens when somebody's discharged from the military? Well, there's, there's a number of... of reasons why people leave. Um, some because they know they've got to. That doesn't always mean it's as easy uh, as it might be if they've actually planned that departure. I had somebody once ring me who was a, a warrant officer um, and he was due to leave the service the following day and he had nowhere to live. Now that's somebody who is, has done uh, a very significant role in their service career but as they've moved on and they've not thought about leaving, and it goes back to trying to get people to think about leaving as soon as they arrive. Because in essence, if they don't do that, then often it's too late to do the planning late in the day. But those who are forced to, to leave through, through no fault of their own often can find it even more difficult because mentally they haven't thought about leaving the armed forces. So somebody who's medically discharged well ahead of when they thought they would leave. Those who are facing administrative or disciplinary issues that mean they have to leave face more challenges than those sometimes who can plan. So what do we have in the UK? So we have a national health service, which you probably many of you will have heard about. And in essence, it's a good system. It provides what it needs to provide. But the reality of life is it doesn't have enough to be able to meet the needs of everybody with mental health problems in the UK. So it has started to think about what it needs to do. It used to commission activity from combat stress, and I'll come on to what we do now, but it doesn't now do that. But in it, the problem, part of the problem we've got is it's the home nations all work differently. So England has now created a, transi a transition um, intervention and liaison service, a TILS service, which looks after people as they leave the services. 
Um, it is just about to launch, or just launched, a complex treatment service, which is a non-residential service that treats individuals in the community. We don't know how that's going to work because it's only just been launched. Scotland commissions Combat Stress to provide residential and community services. And they, again, have a separate first point service, which is part of their NHS services, but again, isn't necessarily funded. Wales has its own veterans mental health service, but they do refer people into, into combat stress as well. And Northern Ireland are particularly difficult because they have a system which says no individual can be treated differently from anybody else. So everybody gets the same thing. And as you'll imagine in Northern Ireland, that can cause some problems with the community that are there. So who else is out there? There's lots of other charities. Help for Heroes, Walking with the Wounded, The Big White Wall, and there's all sorts of, there's about 72, I think, charities in total in the military charity sector that provide some form of support for mental health. Now, we have created a grouping to try and make sure that we're not all doing the same thing and that we're all working together to, to deliver more collaborative and coordinated activity. That's starting to, to show, starting to build um, a dynamic, which means that everybody knows what each other's doing, what each other's developing, and starting to, to make sure that the veterans know where they can go for the services that they need. I think that's really important. It's not about doing it in isolation, it's about doing it together. Uh, and wherever you start this, it's a, that's a, a premise I would start with. So what do combat, services, combat stress do in terms of their clinical services? We have a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week, 365 days of the year helpline. Any individual, whether they're serving or a veteran or a family member, can call it. It isn't about anything other than necessarily being a helpline or then advising the individual where they may need to go. We've just introduced triage into there, so if the individual is found suitable for our services, they will automatically be transferred to the triage, and there are triage nurses there who will carry out that assessment. We then do uh, a community, we do some community work and a whole variety, of, and we're growing that aspect of our work at the moment. Uh, that's largely delivered by nurses and occupational therapists, but we're about to put some <clears throat> therapists, uh, psycho psychological therapists, into the, uh, into the community as well to deliver more intensive treatment. We have a system that works on hub and spoke. We have two treatment centres that provide residential treatment, which includes a six-week residential PTSD intensive treatment service which we know that there's people that still need, and that is something that you might find that you need to look at. How do you provide that sort of intensive treatment over, over a shorter period of time um, than perhaps doing it through a community-based system? We have lots of um, well-being and recovery. We have a peer support system as well, which is delivered by veterans to veterans and tries to help veterans access the services that we provide without that fear of stigma or any sort of a throwback to them. Because again, they still don't particularly want to ask for help. So we are seeing demand going up. This shows um, a little bit of a fall off in uh, 2016, that's because we changed the helpline. And as a consequence of that, the numbers dropped slightly, but it still is on an upward trajectory as we stand at the moment. So we know more people are needing the support that we offer. They are seeking help sooner. So from Iraq and Afghanistan, people are coming between two and four years. That's an awful lot sooner than, than the 15 years for Northern Ireland. And that comorbidity is a really, really important aspect of what we've researched. We know that what the veterans come to us with are multiple issues, not just one. So I will leave you with that, because I'll leave that bit, because we're running out of time. <laughs> Thank you.